ever be as good as they are. In the end, you're still doing what you love and enjoy. And that's already so much better than what a lot of other people can say. Mm. So if ever, just do your best and see where your skill ceiling is. Because maybe in the end, you could become better than them. And even if it's not, at least you've lived out the maximum potential in your life and yeah, done and actually took that risk. Because as I can see from a lot of you guys in the chat, maybe you're young, that you don't know what your uh, future holds, or maybe for some people of you that are older and are making that change. You know, I commend all of you for taking that leap and even just deciding to pursue this journey and do something for yourself that makes you happy. So yeah, just try and keep that in mind. And after a while, you'll just realize that, man, you know, I'm just grateful that I get to do this. And you, you'll you eventually even get to befriend some of these people that you really admire. And yeah, after a while, that rivalry begins to fade. And you're just grateful that you have a lot of talented and great friends that surround you as I, as I am grateful for, you know, having these guys that I can just chat, chat around and mess with on a daily basis and just inspire each other too. So yeah, uh, I, I guess I'll say is that, uh, yeah, just enjoy the journey as cliche as it sounds. And <laughs> Uh, and we're here to do our best to help you guys out in whatever way that we can. Good words. Very good words. Mm -hmm. Chat. So yeah, with that said, I'm going to uh, be ending today's stream. And I'll be raiding Thomas's after this so you guys can continue um, the conversation. And yeah, just uh, yeah. see what Thomas is up to. And I'll just wrap it up by saying thanks a lot, guys, for joining today's stream. Today was an especially long one, but hopefully you guys enjoyed it and got something out of it. And if you haven't followed the channel yet, please do so. And you can also find a link to my Discord channel down in the description box below, where you can chat with all of these awesome artists and learn together, and where I do regular paint overs and even sometimes exclusive events on Discord. So if that sounds like your kind of thing, uh, be sure to join. I've still got to join one. Are you doing one this weekend? Uh, I'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Actually, I might be quite busy anyway. Yeah. Uh, but let me just... Uh, how do I raid again? Slash raid. Oh, yeah. Slash raid? Yep. Slash raid space TSK TSK. Where do I type it in? Uh, in the chat. We'll type oh, it in as slash like that, as raid. Comment. Yeah. And then that's it. TCK underscore TCK. Yeah. That should do it. Okay. All right. And then we give that little message in the top right. All right. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. And as always, stay stretchy. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. How do you spell your username? Slash raid. TCK. TCK. Uh, oh, don't think there's any there's space. No space. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. No and we'll be raiding him in six seconds. Oh. Yay. Awesome. Epic. All right. Okay. Now this is epic. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Peace. And I believe they're on your stream now. Oh my God. Wait. Wow. What a surprise. What a surprise. Incredible. Thank you so much. Such an honor to be dated by the indomitable <laughs> Jordan Hoffman. <laughs> All right. I got to make that custom emoji sometime. One at a time. <laughs> the stretchiest man on Twitch. <laughs> so, Jordan, tell me, how did you get your mantra the stretchiest man on twitch i don't know it just happened i don't know man it was just natural I was man i was born with it <laughs> i'm actually gonna download that episode i mean the stream that i just did i really enjoyed it so, do it do it
put it up on Yoop, Yoop Bloop. Yeah. Uh, but I have copyright music in the background, so that doesn't help. I think the, the negative, the only negative that can come from that is that if you start, if your video gets enough views to become monetized, then the copyright holder can monetize it and take the revenue. Yeah, whatever, take it. I, I'm not in it for the money. And that's the thing. It's like, well, yeah, at least it's unlikely for that to happen. Because uh, it's, it's the same case with a bunch of the videos that I've put up recently. Um, yeah. Exactly. But also, yeah, sure, fine. <laughs> take it. Like, yeah, well, yeah, yeah take it's my it own now. fault. Wait, where is my TS and Axel? They've gone quiet. Oh, we're, we're still there. Oh, so, uh, just just enjoying your monologue, man. Monologue. I'm done. I'm not monologuing anymore. Yeah, God damn it, John. This is my stream. <laughs> Let me monologue. Very impactful, you know. I had no, no, to, that was, that was awesome. to think about it. It comes with age, my friends. You're the wisest says... of them all. You can have to be more specific. Someone in chat, CC the artist, is saying your accent is very satisfying to listen to. Problem is, there's there's four accents here. <laughs> Which one of us? Oh, <laughs> I think it's you though. It's your channel. Yeah, I suppose. But the thing is, like, I started my stream with a monologue from you. Oh. Uh... But I suppose CC could have still been in your stream at that point before switching over side. So Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've never, I've haven't been complimented for my. Oh, so they like the the posh British boy. <laughs> Jordan streamer day person who reads comments and just gets chat by night. Yeah, I have an hourly rate. Oh, oh no! You can be hired. Oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> Can be used, yes. <laughs> oh, I mean, sorry. Um, invited and welcome to stay. Uh... <laughs> oh my god! Wait, Africa Tavo. Sorry, your man voice does do it for me. Lol. No, I'm really confused. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> My man voice. Huh? Oh, okay, does not. Yeah, that makes sense. That would make a, make a lot more sense. <laughs> Although I am deeply offended. Uh, it's okay. You'll hit puberty one day too said that your voice breaks multiple times. I feel like I get a lot more snarky when I jump on your stream. <laughs> <laughs> you come here just to, to knock me it. down. Yeah, it's fun because like I don't <laughs> have to be as professional. I feel like you're you, when you're on your stream, you're talking to your children. But when you're promises, <laughs> you're just chilling. Yeah, I have to like establish dominance over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no age rating here. <laughs> it's not a Christian stream. You can say what you like. Okay, I need to choose what to do with this eye. I was going to go for a big, a big dark orb, kind of like a squirrel. Super shiny. Yeah. I can't even see your stream. I don't have it open. I just have the chat. <laughs> oh, you're just you're still on your. Uh, yeah. Yeah, makes sense. The read. Some lips. Oh, oh yeah, I got some some saucy saucy references up here. <laughs> you can share your pure ref actually. Oh my! I don't have my oh. pure ref open. Um, I couldn't. Yeah, I couldn't find any 
poses exactly like this, but they'll do. That'll do. That'll do. They do for new. <laughs> I like the texture of the brush on the shoulders. It actually makes it look like pores. Oh. Wow. Yeah, I'm hoping some of that comes through with this brush. It's still got a bit of that texture. Mm. It's snake skinny. Yeah. To be honest, what, what I wonder though is it's very the character is wild, right? Yes. Um, pose is very wild, but yes. she has a very serene and composed face. It's like, yeah. She... I I wanted to go for a bit of like a scared animal look. I see. Like I she... didn't I didn't want to just be like yeah she's a predator to so eat your meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I want her to eat my meat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right. So I just figured it would be a slightly different take. Um, yeah. So, but like, yeah, it's it's now sort of a. How do I make it look like there's a wide-eyed expression of the eyes, all black? <laughs> mm. uh, that's that's gonna that's gonna be very very subtle. I can uh, give her goat eyes. <laughs> Just do this. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Give her octopus octopus eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah like this. <laughs> All right, here's a question. Uh, when did I go from I cannot draw to okay, I can do this too. Okay, I'm finally weeding the tools to enjoy the process. Very Wait, good before you do that, before you do that, oh. I'm just gonna say I'm gonna head off now. Before oh. yeah, so I don't interrupt. Farewell. Oh. All right, thanks a lot for oh, watching tonight, guys. Good, goodbye. That was a lot of fun. Right. Good. Uh, and Thank don't you. forget about the, I mean, yeah, Fat Hippo tomorrow. We'll chat about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I want to yeah. come. <laughs> you can. Just grab the train over. I can't do that. <laughs> Fresh Corona. Do that. <laughs> All right. All right. Hugs and kisses. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. All right, hugs and kisses. All right. See you, chat. Bye. Uh, so, I mean, as far as when did that happen, I'd say about just the first time I really sort of felt it would just be when I did Art War 2, so two years ago? I don't know, but I mean, the the thing is, there's this, like, a, a rough graph you can plot of your perceived skill to your, like, current technical skill. And um, the perceived skill is either, yeah, how happy you are with your work at the time, or essentially your artistic eye's ability. So how well you can discern good from bad in, in anything, like how sort of observant you are. And it will it will wiggle up and down. You'll go through a period where you're learning a bunch of theory, learning um, like exploring new artwork by artists, appreciating the subtlety that they're employing, and during that time, essentially your artistic eye is getting uh, more adept and the perception of your own work, of course, is is where it was before. So it's like you're, um, you then need to spend a lot of time uh, building up like the skills required to, to match what you're viewing, to, to be able to put into practice what you've been learning. And at the peak of that, that feels great because at the peak of that uh, journey, you've seen a bunch of stuff, you've worked out what you need to learn, you've then learned how to do it, and then you can, like you described there, I'm wielding the tools and I'm enjoying the process of creating it. And so generally you're in that position for a, for a short while before you know, completing a project, feeling real good about yourself, and then moving on to a new project that requires new skills. Uh, you have like having successfully uh, completed one sort of like a certain level of finish or whatever it is, you're now like, well, you know, how can I go further next time? It's also sometimes you just look back at the work you've just finished and, you know, you just start to see more and more things you'd want to do better or different next time. You don't have to hate it. I mean, some people will describe not liking a lot of the work that they create, but um, I don't tend to have too much of that problem. But you can, I always see things that could be better. And most of the time it's stuff that I don't know how to improve. So that's where you need to go find reference, find uh, like places to learn 
how to improve these elements and you just go through that cycle again. So I don't think there is one, like a specific time that yeah, everything lines up and like suddenly you have the tools and you can use them. But I would say that since about two years ago, I have felt very confident in sort of how I will go through one of those cycles. So like I'd made something which I feel like I was most proud of, the most proud I'd been of a piece ever, perhaps, at least with with my sort of, with like a professional mindset, in a sense. I'm sure there's tons of things that I was overjoyed with as a kid, but I can't remember them, and also they don't quite count. So I don't know if that really answers in it in a satisfying way, but typically you go through cycles of improvement and then satisfaction. My friend thought you just kept food pictures in the top right of your canvas to distract yourself as a reward from working. No, it's reference. It's not that lewd. Uh, I was hoping I would find something good for the back here. And this image gets close to what I need for the back, but it's not quite enough. So we're going to have to do some, some thinking. Do you ever get shoulder back arm pains after a long day of drawing? No, not recently at least, which is nice. Um, I think I've just found a comfortable position in my chair. I don't know, what do you think, boys? <laughs> do, do, do you find that like if you reliably do like a really long day, that's kind of noticeably leave you feeling more, yep. more tired? I render my hands start hurting after a day of rendering. So sketching, drawing, not a problem. But like tight rendering, ooh. Oh, okay, can't right. keep that up for for more than eight hours. After that I obviously like the moment there's like the the slight discomfort I feel in my hand, I actually take a break, do stretches and um, pay attention also I actively pay attention to how much I press down on the tablet. Um because, well, if there's discomfort, it's a clear sign you're doing something wrong. Um, I think actually you brought up a really good point. Yeah, like as soon as you feel something, just stop, basically. Yeah. Sort it out. Have a break. Go hard or go home. No pain, no gain. <laughs> go hard and incapacitate yourself for a week. Or forever. Or forever. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the the pressure sensitivity thing is something that I've, I also always bring up anytime it's alluded to. Um, make your tablet more sensitive. Everyone should do this. Most people yep. don't have their tablet sensitive enough. Uh, Wacom, I know, certainly comes with uh, far too little sensitivity on their tablet out of the box. Um, it, it covers the entire range that's available uh, like in default settings, and that's that's great. There's a bunch of range that's cool. But um, it's it's not good for your wrist. Yeah, for me, I really just have it like one step closer to um, soft, and and that does a trick. Like two steps, and it's basically there's I lose the control over like subtle lines. So only by putting the tip on the without pressing on the canvas, already there's quite a thick line of quite strong line. But with right. with just one step. At least for me, it's fine. Cool. Yeah. I, I, I fiddle around with the graph specifically. Um, yeah, I don't. Thank you. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you so much. <laughs> and they say with it, it's not that lewd, in quotation marks. It's a good, it's a good uh, quote. Arctic work. Thanks for the raid. How are you doing? And thank you. Um, yeah. To be honest, I, I've also, I'm, I'm trying to now stretch like Jordan does. So he has like a little timer on screen, um, or maybe not on screen, I, I don't know where, where or what it is, I can't remember the name, but he has a timer which goes off uh, periodically and he will get off of his desk, rest his eyes, stretch his body, 
I think that's a really good idea. Because I imagine that doing that periodically, you know, far before you actually start feeling any pain, uh, will probably mean you can avoid avoid the build up of any tension before it happens mm. in a sense. Speaking of that, I'm actually gonna gonna um go AFK for a while and do some exercising. Oh mm. I'll stretch keep, time. Uh, Thomas in good company. Alright. Oh thank I'll, you, Matthias. Thank you. I mute my mic though. <laughs> yeah. you, you might make some grunting noises. <sighs> we hear you just <sighs> <gasps> Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I guess uh for the sake of privacy, should I perhaps focus? Yeah, Thomas can entertain his chat in the while. <laughs> okay. All right, okay. All right. Sorry, Let's chat, start. you don't get to hear Axel's heavy breathing. All right, I'll see you. See you in a bit. You've been getting environment made the 3D creature you're working on for a contest. Ooh. Are you doing that in Blender? My previous stream was me suffering in Blender trying to create this box, which I have now created and rendered out. <laughs> but I was suffering. I just I could not get it to work, uh, do what I wanted. I kept running into issues of just like very simple, oh, uh, I didn't press the right button, or something was locked, or I think at one point it was just I had proportional editing on. Um, I had no idea. It was like at a scale, which meant that everything was moving. And I was like, why? I've selected specific objects and the entire, entire mesh is moving. I don't get it. So I was just sort of quietly subbing to myself until someone from the chat managed to save me. I was like, dude, dude, it's just proportional editing. It's okay. There's still a lot to learn, but I will not be deterred just yet. It's been a painful, but uh, the environment has been going much better than the creature. Yeah, I, I haven't considered trying to do any sort of character work um, in Blender. I'm, I don't think I'm going to, outside of like the simplistic stuff I've done with Gravity Sketch, um, trying to do anything sort of specific and like polished. Uh, that's <laughs> that may be something I will never tackle, but if I do, then it's it's something I'll tackle when I'm actually comfortable with the basics of Blender first. Doing a box with some eyes in, I could do this just about. With a periodic Google on every other action that I want to perform. But yeah, more than that, and I think it's like, it's gonna become too much too quickly. I guess like with anything, just yeah, make sure you're doing simple things first. And I, I suppose I was I was jumping in and trying to get a great result before I, you know basically knew any of the most important um shortcuts and stuff like that. What was your build up to this stage of your painting? Uh it was let me just get rid of these for a second. Um And I'll duplicate this, Oop. delete that, and make it all black. So, started with a line art, as you can see here. Um, this is a second pass over the line art, so like I, I did my first sketch, um, I then sketched over it again, refined a bunch of things. Uh, I think I then came back to it again, and this is like, you know, working on all the other, these other characters in between. I uh, came back to it again and sort of got it to this point, which I was happy enough with, like it's sort of final in terms of the uh, the line work I needed to be able to do this. So I then made a mask using the line work, which is where I've kind of got this slightly messy mask, uh, and just did a rough color within it. And the color's sort of completely flat. I was just doing flat tones um, to, yeah, to make sure I had the local colors there. And... Oh uh, yeah, work out the work out the general color scheme because I did this with all the other characters at once so that I could make sure there was enough 
it's like a good balance between them. Um, and then I did this step, which was essentially uh, making a mask for the light. So I had this layer, which is the bright version, and this layer, which is all the shadows. Separate them out as separate, separate layers and then just painted in where I wanted the light to be with a mask. Um, and I did do that with line art on so I could be more accurate to the line art, but I just turned on the opacity. And then what I've done since is uh, taken this line art, which is basically um, I've removed the line art at the edges because um, I've got the silhouette. I don't need this to be visible at the edges like that. I've got my silhouette, so I just removed it. And then the interior shapes, the lineup was still useful, but I wanted it to be, you know, to start feeling more like paint. So I just uh, painted within the lines, added colors to specific areas I wanted, um, and then toned it down. Most of those, and now I'm just painting on top. And actually, yeah, I've, I've chosen to go for, I was thinking I might go for like a red bounce here, but. Um, like the, the bounce light in the scene from below is blue everywhere. And it's been the case in all of these characters, like the bottom of these trousers. It might be nice to, to do to do a warmer light here, but I guess I'm still thinking that it's a predominantly blue glow from her, her box. So I'm not sure. Still not sure. Anyway. Yeah, like it, you just have to learn the tools and practice with it. Um, like I, I went into the, the modeling of that box knowing that I basically I knew the process I was going to go through very roughly. I knew which tools I was going to use. Um, forgotten where they existed uh, in, in certain cases. But I, I had like a, a mental map of how I was going to approach it. But being so essentially inexperienced with using said tools, uh, even just down to like the simplest of manipulations, uh, it was much more difficult because everything was a, a potential for me to slip up and make a mistake every step. See you, Alan. Thanks for joining. Sleep well. Still not entirely convinced about having the blue bounce light here, but um, I think I'll leave it for now. Yep, yeah, I'll leave it for now. Okay, so let's do some rough um, subsurf stuff all around here. I want to make it look nice and vibrant. There'll be a great bounced um, area of light coming off the skin here. Because it'll be nice and bright. The other thing I really want to get with this character is that they uh, they spend their time on all fours, so the underside of their body is going to be pale compared to the upper. Um, sort of like the, the fur you'd see on a squirrel or something like that. I want them to feel animalistic in ways that aren't normal to, to humans. Um, Like normally you'd see if someone like underneath their top or something, their skin would be lighter and just like across their chest because it's not um, typically exposed to sun.
But I also want sort of that that really nice effect of um, like the paler palms that you get um, with darker skin tones. It's just I'm actually going to apply it to like across a leg like this. So as best as possible, I need to make sure that even though it's getting into shadow, I still communicate that it's a, a different color. Like the top's going to be quite a, a deep saturated brown. And the other side, like a, a pale yellow. And uh, yeah, wherever I can sort of make a point of it being darker than its surroundings, like here, even though it might be more of like a contact shadow you'd expect, I'm going to make it brighter so that the skin stands out as being a darker color. And then on the inside here, I can actually do the opposite, despite being in shadow. So yeah, it's in shadow, and so the relative values should still reflect that. So here's like the value of the same straw that's up here. Um, and it doesn't need to be quite so dark, but I want it to remain dark in the way that, um, yeah, it may be put light from the back and then in here it needs to be darker than the skin. It has to be quite subtle though. To really read. But the relative contrast between colors is very important when you're trying to do things that are slightly more subtle. Um, people are following. Thank you very much. For some reason, it's not popping up in my chat. I, I also... <laughs> Sorry, but I tend not to bother. Um, <laughs> responding, individual followers. I've had discussions about this with Jordan, and he's like, you're just lazy. And I go, well, I'd much rather focus on giving meaningful replies to actual comments. I think if, if I'm sort of trying to respond to everyone that, that that follows, like my mind is very distracted from whatever I'd actually be describing. Joris, hello. How are you? All right, I want this nice like pinch in the skin here. For folds and skin and uh, other sort of organic materials, um, something I'm very aware of is that you you try and construct like a smooth gradient that goes into a hard change. That seems to be the sort of most appealing way to describe these forms. Um, and the other thing is that when there's stuff in bright light like this, um, that dark, that ramp into darkness um, will get far more saturated. because it's getting bounce light hitting it that's already been colored. All right, I think I'll do for now. I think this little foxy here thing coming over the top. Like so. Okay, I haven't exactly decided what I want to do with this, those leg pieces. In my mind, it was like a thing made of weaved, weaved straw, that kind of thing, and then uh, feathers attached to the outside, or perhaps leaves that um, that capture that same sort of shape. The main thing is I want to, yeah, I want to just capture that nice flowing shape. That's the thing I really want from them. That soft taper to a point, oftentimes a slightly curved point. Um, I find it very appealing. 
and you can get that either from the tips of feathers or from um, the right shaped leaves. So it doesn't matter too much which I pick. And now it's down to sort of color, like what, what color would suit these areas. And I could really go for a mix. So it might not matter too much really what I pick anyway. My general approach to coloring this set of characters as well has been to aim for vibrance that you know, makes them pop out, makes them feel... Uh, I had another word for, for what I was aiming for. Um, not shimmering. I think someone actually commented up on Instagram. Uh, I mean, opalescent is what I want these sort of magical areas to, to feel like. But there's another one. I'm not sure. So, say thanks for joining. You like the painting, and you're generally more of an environment person. Oh, well, thank you for joining and sticking around. Sleep well. All right, and so for the sake of simplification, what I want to do is kind of bunch some of this stuff up into um, tufts, like tufts of this kind of like uh, hay stuff. And this should do a fairly nice job of, like if I keep the edges rough before their transition, that will kind of show like the complexity of the edge. Um, I don't want to go in and you know draw individual individual hairs. Plus, it's more appealing to to clump them into larger chunks, so you can have some nice shape variation between them. Um, going back to like the general process that I've used to get to this point. When I separate out uh, the colors of a, of like my, my base color scheme, when I separate it into light and dark, so stuff that's in direct light and stuff that's in shadow, um, this, this results in a fairly neutral sort of bland feeling across the piece. <clears throat> it's very consistent and the, the areas that are like transitioning between dark and light, those are the areas that need the most work because naturally that just uh, two layer blend can't account for the, the way that colors shift through hues uh, on the way. So essentially, you know, this area is going from um, the sort of light pinky orange down into a very deep desaturated red. And in between there, there should be a slightly more saturated um, dark orange. But instead we get a far more desaturated one because of the way that Photoshop blends color. And it, and it makes perfect sense. Um, it's how we expect colors to blend. So something that you know, you'll see with subsurface scattering specifically is that the, the light goes in to the surface and picks up the color of that object far more than it would with a single bounce because it's bouncing around, it's scattering within the surface. And so it's filtered down to its the specific color that that material favors over and over until it's much stronger. It also means that it can bleed past the uh, the actual end of the shadow. Um, and that's why it um, expands a bit further. It doesn't just make the shadow uh, more saturated, it makes the area around that shadow more saturated. And that's definitely not something that the this kind of method of blending would, would pick up. So a lot of my process here at first at least is going through and adding in that extra color that's required to really sell the material. If you look here, a great example is where I have done that on the legs. So if you look at these trousers here, 
Um, it feels very kind of dull in the way that this yellow transitions to the, the really desaturated version. And the main thing that I've done is put in this, this much more rich uh, yellow where yellow light is reflecting off this bit and bouncing into the shadow and getting more color in there than you'd expect. And that's what makes it the material read. It makes it feel far more vibrant. And it can be quite rough, like from a distance. It matters because I've got large enough quantities of it. It's not literally just around the edge of a shadow. It's in a larger chunk of reflection. Um, so from a distance, yeah, the whole material feels like it's brighter. And that's sort of the most important thing for me to do right now is, is bring back the vibrance into areas that uh, had it sort of removed when I went through that uh, lighting process. And like deeper saturation is kind of just my, my main push. I want to make the pieces feel as balanced and realistic as I can get them whilst also um, just going further with like color than I have in, in other pieces, trying to squeeze color into areas that otherwise you wouldn't expect to see them. And also couldn't see them in any sort of realistic situation. I think in, in general, that's a nice thing that you can uh, really utilize in artwork is, is how you break away from reality. Use reality as much as you can to make something believable and then break away from it to make it as appealing as possible. But of course, yeah, that needs to be within reason for our eyes to look at something and accept it as uh, a real object. And I think that's a better way of looking at approaching uh, artwork is instead of going for what is real, um, using the, the properties of things that are real to yeah, make something that isn't real, feel it. So when you look at a piece, you can, you can understand what the material is. You can imagine holding it in your hands, or you can imagine seeing it in front of you. Things like perspective mostly inform the, the sense of scale and like the presence of an object. And then yeah, materials will sort of give you information about how it feels to the touch. Uh, other, other associations we'd have with it, like its smell, things like that. Um, with, with food, I guess, if you do really successful uh, artwork of food, you can you can make people hungry when they look at it. Like that's that's clearly where you're successfully capturing the essence of that um, object to the extent that you're being able to like withdraw those same reactions, the same real reactions from people when they view it. I want that from everything I think I do. I don't think there's any real, I don't think there's any situation in art where I wouldn't aim for uh, those, like conjuring those emotions in the viewer. I can't think of a reason you, you wouldn't want to, unless it was to contrast within your scene. Like, it, yeah, I still can't think it would actually work or necessarily look well. It might be an interesting thing to explore actually. But using, using the opposite of what I've just said to convey contrast, like say I want to put something robotic and stiff and um, something that really doesn't feel alive and contrast it with a hero or a character or just a different character um, in a scene. Unfortunately, all of those things are still drawing from elements that we've experienced in real life. So it's, yeah, I suppose that even that doesn't mean like there's elements you employ to make something look like it's machinery or like it's uh, inert, but those are all real attributes of real materials. 
So imagine trying to imply the like a, a new material that doesn't exist. I think that definitely has its uses. That's where you can start to combine attributes of a, a material, like materials we are familiar with and, and do things which we would otherwise think impossible. Um, I'm sort of trying to touch on that idea with the leader character. He's, or he or she, I haven't, um, I've, I've kept it ambiguous because I feel like that adds to the sort of the mystery. Of course, this is this whole challenge is called mystery box, so mystery is is great if I can um, if I can conjure that feeling. But they they're like a somewhat fourth dimensional being. That's kind of the uh, the skills and talents of, of assigned to them, and so they're walking through the air on something that we can't see. Like uh, to our eyes, it's they're doing an impossible task, um, and their character design doesn't make any sense if they were going to try and walk on the ground because their arms are are longer than they they drag below the level of their feet. So this is kind of where I'm trying to break from what is real to convey a new feeling that people uh, haven't experienced, but. To make it believable, to for people to buy in to the the bits that are different, I have to make sure that the bits that can be similar um, are similar. So they have they have recognizably human anatomy. The lighting is behaving like you'd expect on most of the materials. Um, all this kind of thing. Like I'm starting to push away from real materials in in areas like this. Like these hands, I really wanted to feel special. I like this ancient and non-describable material that is brighter in the shadows and more colorful than you could ever achieve. Um, not quite shiny and metallic, but vibrant nonetheless. This is where I'm sort of combining elements of different materials to come up with something that's new uh, and feels special because of it. And then yeah, these are, these are the sort of straight up uh, surreal elements, walking in air, leaving a trail of footprints like that just float there. That's the surreal stuff that immediately makes you think, okay, this is weird and I don't get it. And it's uh, hopefully interesting. Mystery. And it's sort of the same thing here. Like uh, the this character, their theme is insight. Hence you can see inside their body. Wow, such a clever pun. But the visuals of this are, yeah, this incredibly bright um, scene. Like it's it's a material that you really can't imagine. You can't um, necessarily justify. Like I can't tell you what materials allow this thing to be possible. How I'd be able to create this sort of look in 3D, no idea. Um, it would require a lot of workarounds, a lot of sort of cheating things because real light systems would never give this result. But as long as I surround that by grounded materials, like this puffer jacket, these trousers, these are things we understand. That's that's what justifies the the stuff in the scene that isn't real, that isn't realistic. Anyway, back to wild. So no, uh, I didn't. So I brought up three D as in like areas like this would be wouldn't be possible in 3d i did the box in 3d uh because i wanted to just make it more accurate it was also partly to test a workflow um <laughs> more than anything else uh if i take away these bits this is this is the 3d render i think pretty much with no edits um and this is the stuff i put put on top and these are the just the other passes i used for it but everything else here is is painted because I have no idea how to achieve anything close to this in 3D.
Yeah, going back to the thing I was talking about with local colors, this is actually a really important area. Whilst it's sort of unclear on this side because uh, there's a, a line that cuts shadow from light and so it's less easy to see the transition of um, the local color. Oh, you're going to bed. Farewell. Thanks for joining. Sleep well. Um, seeing these two sides together shows us the transition in light, which is here, and then the transition in dark. So it's really important that I, yeah, I'm careful with how I treat the color in both areas so that together they give the full like, picture. They communicate a full understanding of uh, the change in the local color of the skin. All right, so somewhere here, I need to show the other shoulder is kind of bulging up. I really want to see the like the separation of the um, shoulder blade because this arm's kind of flat and coming out, so the shoulder blade should be laying somewhat flat, and this one's coming down. So I'd expect to see the shoulder blade uh, push up. Goldsome Incident, thank you very much. It's for the Art Station Challenge. Uh, which is why I'm putting everything I've got into it. Um, I really enjoyed these challenges for how they sort of, they just naturally make me want to push for something that I haven't achieved before. Like going back to the idea of um, colors that don't exist and things that don't exist. Like I want to make this series of designs special. I want them to feel like they haven't been, it's stuff that I haven't explored before. Um, it's got visuals and colors and ideas that I haven't seen in other people's art either. Like I want them to stand out as different to anything else. That's obviously very, very hard to do. I, I think they do in places. I don't think they do in others. Um, as I continue to refine them, I, I intend to add add more like ideas to them where I can squeeze in more things that make them stand out as like a yeah just so that there's like a, a, an overwhelming feeling that these are something that hasn't been done in this way or, or whatever whatever it is I feel like that's kind of the core um, aim of a character design challenge is to, to push for something that's new and, and different so instead of going with stuff that I know is kind of safe, um, I want it to be a bit more out there with, with designs. Um, and, and then within that, make sure that I have enough that is recognizable and enough that is uh, familiar to people so that it's not totally alienating. A lot of that comes in the render of it, but uh, part of it also comes with some of the characters just having very sort of normal looking elements uh, included. So I have a Joyful, which I haven't got to yet. She's she's a bit closer to sort of what I'd describe as generic in a sense. Um, I've pushed the the size and shape of all of the, the elements that I've included. Um, I'll open it up so you can see. But she's essentially just a, you know, she's can be described as cute girl in armor and a chef at the same time. It's it's stuff which is familiar and appealing. I know it's familiar appealing and you know it's naturally become the most popular of all the designs. So um yeah it all makes sense. But I personally I don't feel I've done as much some as much that's special with her. Like I don't think it's stands out as much as other ones do. Like this, for example, which I think, at least for me, is very different to things I've done before. And I feel like this character is actually quite different to other things that I've done personally in my portfolio, but a bit closer to a design that I think people would sort of know and understand. 
Michelangelo on steroids. <laughs> I should win. Well, I certainly hope so. Um, Ruben, you started Blender. Hell yeah. And they also did the Fishman. You love that painting so much. Whenever you look at it, I feel like you would be good at painting. <laughs> um, thank you. I'm actually still very pleased with uh, that one. I would like to do something, some more in that kind of like rough, but with like a really harsh key lighting style. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I think up to that point I've been, well, I suppose that piece does it as well, but I've been doing a lot of like hiding stuff in shadows and being quite soft with lighting. And in that one, I was very harsh. It's, it's bright daytime. The light's really hitting down. I still have stuff lost in shadows because part of making that lighting look really harsh was by um, really crushing the, the values of the shadows. But they, uh, they still have quite clear sort of internal um, framework and stuff. Like you can still see what's, what's going on within them. But yeah, I really enjoyed doing that piece. Um, it felt like quite a sort of breakthrough in a sense when I did it, uh, especially since I, I got a bunch of feedback from, from friends as I was doing it, which made me kind of think about the piece quite differently, um, as I was making it and also just naturally improved it a lot. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> that's that's nice to know. But the thing is, uh, our station naturally attracts a, a bunch of very, very talented uh, artists. I mean, there's a bunch of really great entries um, at the moment, especially like, you know, they're still forming. People haven't necessarily even gotten into rendering them yet. So I'm staying vigilant to the end. And I won't be any doing anything else until submission. Outside of you know day job, this is this is all I'm going to be doing. Artwise, um, until the challenge deadline rolls around, and then submit and hope for the best. The nice thing is because this challenge doesn't have a second round where it's purely three D production artwork. Um, which is also sort of a shame because you know if if this has been as uh, popular, at least on ArtStation has been so far, then I figured that quite a few people might end up doing 3D work from it. Um, but that's not the case, which is a pity. I'd love to see some of this stuff done in 3D, but that's okay. Would I rather know the results of a challenge a month earlier? Maybe. Um, it was really cool though, because in the even in the feudal Japan one, um, some people did uh, artwork based on my entries, and that was that was awesome to see. Especially where they you know solved issues that my my artwork had, like you know proportions that just don't fit human anatomy at all. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the feudal Japan entry that I made, but it's. Like all the humans in it, apart from the uh, the peasant, which and this is quite deliberate because I wanted them to feel kind of godly, like a godly representation of that um, position in in the class system, in the feudal system. Uh, they're all like incredibly stretched out. You've got this like tiny head sitting on top of these monstrously long limbs, um, filling up these ridiculous uh, outfits. That was kind of like how I was choosing to push push my work in that challenge. I was just trying to take the the design of the historical clothing to its extremes uh, while still feeling somehow believable. Really not sure how how to describe the, the ways that I keep things feeling believable or attempt to at least. But that was a very big part of what I was doing there. It's just like constantly sort of doing a back and forth, a balancing act between um, ridiculous and and real. All right, skin is looking a lot more like skin. That's nice.
I'm studying filmmaking. Oh, wait, sorry, uh, there's a question above that. In your initial stages of painting, do you establish light and shadow or decide a color palette first? So I have decided the color palette first in these in this case. So you can see that this is this is my rough, or this is my flat color. Um, I, I did with the silhouette and the line work on, on top, and then I added lighting to that by splitting it up into shadow layer and a light layer, and then masking it on. Uh, Reincorporate the line art with, uh, with color. And then I'm um, painting over the top. Um, I'm studying filmmaking and animation, but even uh, I work hard, it's never enough. It still sucks. I feel very inspired when you see your artwork. Um, I don't know if there's a particular question in there, but keep going. <laughs> I mean, it's. This, at least what I've got to, certainly didn't happen overnight. It's it's 10,000 hours old of study. Um, it's interesting though, I was describing this to some friends the other day, that rule, the, you know, spend 10,000 hours working in a certain field on a profession, on a skill, and you'll, you know, obtain a degree of mastery. Um, I tried to do a rough calculation to see, like, in terms of working and this is this isn't even uh, including you know the my experience of art during childhood, like just doing stuff that I, I enjoyed. But from the point where I knew that I wanted to do digital art for this industry, or yeah, essentially from that point, so where I started to study the right things, like um, pay attention to fundamentals and things like that. Um, when I was actually doing that calculation, I I found it to be almost like basically I was hitting 10,000 hours as I was doing that that calculation and that was a year or so ago um maybe two years I can't remember so if I had to just guess off the top of my head I'm probably on something like 12 13,000 hours or something it'd be interesting to actually put this in a spreadsheet um and sort of keep track of it in a sense I'd like to know um and also I can, I can make sure that my sort of working out in, um, in my first calculation is roughly correct, but yeah, it was, it was cool to do. And it, it really gave a, a clear sort of answer to, to that question. Um, or a sort of like a, at least a fairly clear, like confirmation. Um, that's, that's the amount of time I've, I've been doing like mindful, either mindful study or literally doing work for clients. And that's, yeah, that's when I started to see the the result. What I'd also like to do, and I've said this multiple times and haven't found time to do it yet, or I've just been too lazy or distracted, is actually make a huge PDF that just has every piece of artwork I can find that I did digitally. Obviously, it can't include any clients that have worked, but everything personal that and just put it in chronological order so I can see an art journey. Um, I think that like there's a ton of work sort of in the period of 2014, 2015, 14, up till, oh, I can't remember exactly the period. I can, I can see it really easy if I just log to DeviantArt. I guess there's a gap. <laughs> it's just a big gap in DeviantArt. Um, also, so someone was asking if they uh, would mind uh, posting the art session for advice. Um, I'm going to be ending soon, I think. Uh, just in the description, I have a Discord. Uh, you can join the Discord and you can just message me there directly if you want. Um, and I can try and take a look at it at some point. Probably won't be tonight, though. But yeah, just, just send it to me directly. Um, I'm not going to do it on stream right now just because I, I want to get this done. But yeah, there's a gap between basically 2015 and 2018. That sort of transition from not doing, uh, essentially not just doing like 
random uh, anime illustrations digitally because it was when I first got my tablet, that's what I was doing. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I, I still really enjoyed the art style, but I lost interest in doing it myself at, at some point. Uh, well, in 2015, I stopped uh, and I started to do work that I knew would be like in demand in the industry, essentially. And that's it's also the work I was inspired to do at the time. But I started doing work like that. Um, and there's, there's basically, it's since a lot of it's been removed from ArtStation, well, I removed it specifically because that's how you keep a professional looking portfolio, basically, you know, when you're applying for a job, you only put the work in there that you're proud of or that you're being proud of it. Isn't even the, the point like that you, that you know is good enough or that you hope is good enough. Um, it's, it's, it's very, uh, yeah, important. It is just important that you show you can be like critical of the work you've created in a sense. Um, don't show things that you don't think are good enough or that you know aren't good enough because it will give the wrong impression to anyone that's looking at your work. Um, you know, to the extent that they don't know whether you are aware of its flaws or its problems or whether you think this sort of thing is passable, that kind of stuff. I, I had a fairly, like, I can't remember who it was with exactly, but they were saying, they kind of went through the portfolio and just said, get rid of this, get rid of this, get rid of this, keep that, get rid of this. Um, and it's really useful. It's, it's, it was really useful to have that kind of like spur around. Oh yeah, of course. You know, I, I've kind of been aware of this because all the talks talk about it, you know, advice for students and their portfolios. I'd heard it so many times, but still I had just managed to kind of ignore it. Um, but yeah, to, to properly sort of just get that feedback directly. And then I think it sort of just clicked it. Under, I understood it better. Somehow I like looked at the work and again and sort of went, yeah, I, I know why I'm still fond of this and anyone can be kind of, uh, could find value in it, but it's not representative of, um, of your peak, what you're actually capable of. And because of that, it can't be there. Um. Ruben, you calculated around about seven seven k hours. Ah, interesting. I guess that means you're scrapping your your whole portfolio then. Well, um, another thing that I I remember popping up in all of these uh, talks where people are asking like advice for students. Um, the advice a lot of the time was like, um, once you're finished with any sort of course, you get rid of all of your student work, and you recreate your portfolio. Um, which, which I understand why they kind of go for that kind of hard, hard approach. Firstly, because it's probably, probably true. It's probably very good advice, but it, it makes a very good point about how it's not about what you've done up to that point. It's about how you're, what, what you're capable of now. Having finished a complete sort of course of training, what are you now capable of? Go make a project that exemplifies that. Um, and don't, yeah, don't certainly think that you can sit around and be like, well, you know, I'm done. Here's my student. Here's the work I did at, on my course. Um, I'll apply with this. Um, yeah, I, I still think it's good advice. I can't remember where I've, where these things are coming from. I think it's just sort of GDC talks and stuff. Um, a lot of this has come from. They're all things that I've just kind of I've, I've found on YouTube and listened to whilst working at some point. And I still find it interesting because it doesn't matter what the advice is aimed at or who the advice is aimed at, professional or um, student, like it's, it's useful advice that you can forget about sometimes. And it doesn't matter whether it's your, yeah, what, what level you're at. Uh, if you're applying for a job, the all of this advice stands regardless. If you want that job, then you, you show the work that the, uh, the studio needs and you take out work that doesn't exemplify your skills. 
that's never going to change. It doesn't matter how good the recent stuff is. It's always going to be better to not put it in, uh, to not put in that order work. Uh, okay, right, so I think I'm probably going to end the stream for this evening. Uh, because got to do some stuff and go to bed. Work tomorrow. Uh, and I was so sleepy today. Partly because it was really warm. And I think I just I just feel weak and drained when it's when it's too warm. But you know, it could also just be that I need to get some more sleep, so both uh is uh are very valid reasons to call it a day. Plus I have actually made some decent progress. Um I was hoping to get further, but that's okay. Uh, the heat's too much for me. The digital art is among the best I've seen. Oh, thank you very much. I want it to have an impact. I think that's the biggest thing I'm really aiming for. I want there to be like a an immediate feeling when you see it that it somehow stands out or like feels like it's pushing into territory that hopefully people haven't seen before. That's that's what I want. And I honestly, I'm I'm very pleased at the moment. I'm I'm riding on like a. Actually, I was discussing this during Jordan's stream, but you've got that like scale of perceived, um, yeah, like your ability to perceive uh, problems with artwork. So you're sort of the your artistic eye versus your current skill level. So what you can actually execute versus what you can see. Um, like the problems that you can identify and you go through stages where essentially the, you can see more problems than you can actually execute on. And so during that time, it's a lot of hard work, a lot of dissatisfa dissatisfa uh, dissatisfaction, um, and struggle. And then you struggle through until you are able to, uh, act on those, um, perceived issues. And that feels great because now you've, you've seen the problem and you know how to fix it. And for a while before you end a project and, you know, start learning some new stuff for a while, that's when you have the most confidence you've had for a long time. But that's the case at the moment. I feel at least with these characters, I feel I have studied a bunch of stuff. I've learned a load of things, had some epiphanies, you know, seen some artwork that's really changed my perspective on how to approach stuff and I've put in the work to learn how to fix those issues. So right now, certainly whilst I'm just starting to like render these characters up, it's just like a constant, wonderful reward, uh, which I'm really enjoying. And based on like feedback on these so far, it seems like it's working, which is of course just going to boost that feeling. So it's great. I'm, <laughs> I'm having a great time at the moment. And, uh, yeah. It's probably going to be like that until I finish this project. Um, who knows, perhaps towards the end, I'll start to, you know, see, see problems that I want to fix, but that's not a bad thing considering it's a competition. Like I want to be, like I earlier said, I want to be vigilant. I want to make sure I'm improving until the very end uh, on all of these pieces. So yeah.
That's such a good way of putting it. I see a lot of problems and it can get overwhelming. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's how it, that's how it happens. Ruben, miscalculated. Actually, 5,500. Oh. I mean, this is the problem. Like, it, it's so hard to know if you're being accurate. But. I can't remember whether I erred on the side of, like, being generous with the amount of time I spent on things or being, like, you know, in a day which I sat at my computer for 10 hours, I probably did how much of that time was actually productive. Like, how much time did I watch a video, um, that kind of thing. And it's hard to say, cause like, maybe you should include that sort of information because it's, it's time that you spent essentially what you call working. And if you call it working, then in the future, it could be that you would call that same process working. So if you're trying to sort of like, you know, see how well, how, how fast you might improve and that kind of thing, it's best to be realistic to your actual practices. Um, and not like a, well, yeah, I probably spent even longer this, this weekend. And then the flip side of course, is that if you are then like reducing the, the amount of time, then yeah, it would sort of potentially give the impression that you were improving perhaps faster than, than you could. So it's kind of like, you know, in general, a more accurate way is, you know, how many years have you spent or how many weeks, days, that kind of thing, because. There are a broader time scale where it, it takes into account the fact that you can't work for an entire day. It takes into account the, the things that are always going to be around you, the, uh, you know, uh, other commitments that you have that you have to attend to. But of course it then doesn't, uh, keep room for people that are actually more dedicated and more disciplined and that kind of thing. And if you know that you have been more disciplined, then it's, you know, that you can tally up hours quicker in, in what you would describe as a working flow. My plan job stories. Yeah. I get tired of the cliche concept arts and I see unique art. Crash Bandicoot mask. Yeah. Wait, no, don't say that. It's supposed to be unique and special. Ah, I just stole it from crash. Surprising how little time it takes to learn your software when you can look, uh, look at your hourly breakdown. Makes people complaining about it look rather amusing. Yeah, it's, the thing is, it just, it's hard. It feels like hard work. And man, I felt that on my last stream when I was struggling with Blender. Um, it also, it was like, I could, I had clear reasons to, to show that it's hard work. Like I wasn't able to interact with the chat at all, really. Um, I was glad that I had Ruben to carry some interesting conversation whilst I was just like floundering with, with the, <laughs> um, but I got stuff done eventually. Um, it, it's, it's interesting. All right. Um, I shall think I'll finish for the evening. Done some stuff that I'm happy with. Um, now I need to find someone to raid. Okay. Let's raid Sakawa and actually say hello to them. So that I can. <laughs> I can finally do it properly. So I've done it like three times now and just had to disappear immediately. I have a couple of minutes to actually say hello. So we're going to do that. Um, yeah, thank you for joining. It's been really good. Uh, a bit shorter than normal, but uh, I will, yeah, hopefully find some time to stream again. The main thing is that like I want it to be a substantial amount of time to stream and settle down and do this. Uh, and I need to be in the right mindset to be able to do a productive session as well as talk. Sometimes I can only do one of those. Anyway, farewell. Hopefully I'll see you all again soon. Bye-bye.